colourful story of what happened in the Hong Kong suburb of Yunlong on July the 21st last year has been told thousands of times. Evil gangsters attacked innocent passengers of the Yunlong MTR train station, chasing them up the stairs and beating them on the train. Police, shockingly, walked away at the start of the attack and returned when it was over, revealing that they were cooperating with the gangsters. That is the story we've all been told. But let's take a closer look. Five days before that incident, on Tuesday, July the 16th, radical protesters who like to dress in black travelled to Yunlong with their rather hostile messages. They were not well received by some local people there who asked them to leave. Angry, the protesters said they would return with a larger group on Sunday, July the 21st to settle the matter. Uh, here's their poster. Now, all sides knew this spelled trouble. Yun Long has a strong triad society, and triads consider radical protesters to be troublemakers and lawbreakers. Yes, there is a dash of irony there. The triads also used a poster to notify their members about the need for defence. Theirs featured coded messages about a traditional performance of martial arts and stick fighting. Get it? The triads claimed the moral high ground, pointing out that they were just defending their home patch from a group known for violence and for breaking the law, which was actually true, albeit still ironic. Meanwhile, the radical protesters had discovered that the media would give them the moral high ground, however violent they were and however many laws they broke. Now, let me put my cards on the table here. I've been a peaceful protester in Hong Kong for 30 years. Um, here's, my, here's a picture of my first protest. That was in 1989. I'm 100% in favour of human rights and freedom of speech, but I'm totally opposed to violence. Now, by the time July the 21st came around, the radical protesters were creating mayhem in more locations simultaneously than ever before. These included uh, copious use of petrol bombs, an attack on the China liaison office, a brutal beating of a driver who complained about their roadblocks, and so on. Meanwhile, back in Yunlong, the triads in their white t-shirts had been waiting for their visitors from 6.46 onwards. Uh, they waited a long time. It wasn't until 10.40 that night that a significant group of about 100 radical protesters, some in black, some in ordinary clothing, arrived at Yunlong MTR station. Uh, at the time there were about 30 people from the white-dressed faction waiting to face them down at the station. Uh, both groups, interestingly, uh, expressed hostility to a third group of people, uh, the police, of whom uh, there were just three present at the time. Uh, now, there were some minor skirmishes between the two factions at first, but the confrontation settled into a shouting match, at which point the police were seen leaving and were assumed to be running back to the police station. Uh, in fact, they weren't. They'd been told to go to their patrol car, where they'd be joined by reinforcements. A second patrol car, containing three more uniformed officers, was dispatched at this time, which was 10.45. Now, on the concourse, the craziness started to escalate. Three minutes later, at 10.48, more white-dressed people arrived, holding flags, sticks and umbrellas. The three extra police officers arrived at 10.52. Now, we could ask, why such a small response from the police? Well, it's important to remember that two factions screaming at each other is unpleasant, but it's relatively mild stuff compared to the murderous firebomb fueled insanity that was going on 30 kilometers away on Hong Kong Island. Uh, also at this time some members of the public called the police but the protesters had called on all supporters to make repeated 999 calls to disable the emergency call system. The protesters also blocked the doors of the train on the platform preventing the driver from continuing on his journey. Uh, now this was 10.55 Yunlong police chief seemed to have a premonition that the face-off was escalating, so at 10.57 they ordered the deployment of a quick response team and a group of Tier 3 officers. While these officers were being briefed and put on their equipment at the police station, the anger between the two factions at the MTR station boiled over. 
At 11.02, the faction dressed in white jumped over the ticket gates into the paid area where the faction dressed in black were standing. People in black dropped heavy objects onto the heads of the people in white. By 11.05, the verbal confrontation had turned into a massive brawl. The people in white quickly gained the upper hand and the people in black retreated up the stairs. Uh, the triads followed at 11.06. While this was happening, the larger group of police officers left the police station at 11.07. Now, the violence in and around the train took place between 11.08 and 11.13, and the police uh, reached the railway station at 11.14, just as that brief period of fighting came to an end. But that wasn't the end of the story. That was just a single episode in a much longer story. Radical protesters from Central headed to Yunlong to uh, provide reinforcement and continue the fighting. And in fact, battles between the two factions continued for hours, uh, both at the station and at other locations. The Yunlong police were kept very busy and needed the help of riot police from Hong Kong Island. Uh, things in the area didn't settle down until about five o'clock the next morning. Now, given the facts, given the, this full story, what are our findings? Uh, clearly, what happened that evening was not a spontaneous attack by gangsters on train passengers, nor was it a story about police. In hindsight, they could have made other decisions, but that's always true, right? What happened that night was that a planned, deliberate confrontation took place between two violent factions of people. If you made a list of arrestable offences committed that night, the black dress faction and the white dress faction would both be on it, and both lists would be long. Let me leave you with this thought. We the media are not serving the Hong Kong people well. Most journalists are pushing their agenda instead of doing their jobs. What we should be doing is digging up facts and presenting them to people and letting the people make up their own minds about things. Peace.